Welcome to the Minotaur's Maze. Today I will be speaking with Tanya Beck, who is a law student, future barrister, and entrepreneur. She is passionate about human rights, women, families, and justice. However, the story takes a dark turn because Tanya was a victim of attempted murder, which completely toppled her life. Despite the unimaginable challenges faced, she has managed to get things back on track with a budding legal career and online business. Tanya, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Now, that's quite a story. Um, and, and obviously, the, you know, the big thing there is the attempted murder. Um, yes. And, in, you know, as comfortable as you are with sharing your story there, you know, can you tell us a bit about what happened? Yes. Um, eight years ago, almost to the day, now uh my now ex-husband after 10 years of a very calm peaceful gentle marriage had a very large breakdown which resulted with me being woken up at 5 30 in the morning with a club, ha club hammer on the side of my head not the way most people expect to wake up i'm not a morning person at the best of times and everything went crazy the whole world just turned upside down in that split moment and um yeah it was certainly unexpected very gentle stable calm relationship of over a decade nothing ever before like this had wow. happened okay okay so, so there were no never glimpses or anything it was just completely out of the blue Yes. I mean, talk about your life, obviously, before that, you know, what was the, the family life, the business life, you know, how, how was it in your state of mind? How was it before that event? It was fine. I mean, I had been, at the time, I was a childminder. I was registered with Ofsted, had been working, I think, about seven years. So fairly established, good ratings, etc. Um, he was also registered as my assistant at one point so that we could look after more children or I could do a school run without him. Um, without taking all the children with me every time, and so on. Um, very calm, very loving person. Uh, he was very much the, the homemaker, enjoyed baking, ironing, all the domestic tasks, and I really wasn't. So we worked well together. It was a good balance. Um, and yeah, life was good. We had to move home and town shortly before the event. So I'd only been in the town at, uh, for a month when this happened. I didn't really know anyone, didn't have any friends, didn't have any form of stability there yet, um, which of course is difficult when something like this happens, but it turns out to be good in the end because that was my town, if that makes sense. Right. We didn't have a lot of shared memories there, but no, very stable, very calm. Um, we both worked. Me from home as a childminder and him in a different job as well as being my assistant. And things were very calm and gentle. He had had some very difficult news, which for confidentiality I can't go into. No, I, yeah. um, very difficult news in the days running up to the event. And that alongside some other incidents, which I learned of later, I didn't know at the time, I imagine just became too much for him to cope with life. Right. Yeah. Okay. So... The events happened. I mean, mm. what do you remember at the time it happened and, and, and the day and the days that followed? Mm. I remember waking up in the morning with the most beautiful display of fireworks. Right. I cannot explain the range of color. And I thought it was a dream. I wasn't sure because you're not expecting this. And the explosion of light and sound was what I woke up to, which was actually quite nice in a bizarre way because you don't know what's happening for that split moment. I initially thought we had an intruder and then I realized very quickly that it was my ex-husband, my husband at the time, doing this. Um, little things that I remember, it can be blurry at times now, but um, 
his expression was completely vacant, as if he was sleepwalking. He put the hammer down and said, I've gone mad, darling, call an ambulance. And then started wow. whistling and getting dressed for his day for work, as if... Wow. Yeah. And that was the wow. scariest, I think, in everything, that was the most difficult for me. Because yeah, of course. he was there, but there was nobody home, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I had two children asleep upstairs, and at this point, of course, I realized that he'd lost his mind. I didn't know if they were alive or not. I didn't want to check because I didn't want to lead him upstairs, so it was a very difficult half hour or so before the police and the ambulance arrived, not oh. knowing if I would find them alive or not. Mm -hmm. you know. But, um... That was it. The, the, the police came, the ambulance came, the house was crawling with people like one of those videos that you see, the crime scene dramas. They're very blurry. I mean, it, of course, there was a lot of shock. You know, I remember taking a police officer upstairs mm -hmm. and waking up the children who were asleep, thank God, wow. um, and telling them that this nice young policeman was going to make them pancakes for breakfast. Mm -hmm and that I wasn't well, I had to go and get checked at the hospital and daddy wouldn't be home either. Right. Um, they still remember the excitement of, I mean, how many kids get a policeman making them pancakes for breakfast? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in the days following, just lots and lots of interviews and questions over and over and over again. Um, the most frustrating being asked by the police repeatedly whether this had happened before, and then repeatedly telling me that if I would just tell them the truth, they would believe me, and then not believing it. And they gave me all the statistics. Uh, I, I think it's uh, domestic violence can happen 30 times before it's reported, and they will believe me if I tell them the truth, but they didn't. And that was incredibly frustrating, mm -hmm. because I felt at that time like I shouldn't have to be defending him when I need to focus on myself yeah. and my children and this bizarre situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and okay, so I mean, what do you think the police were trying to do that? Because I, obviously I read your article and you know, mm. it's quite frustrating with, with the way they yes. handled it. Yes. Um, what do you think, you know, what, did they have an agenda? Were they trying to establish something? Um, you know, why were they trying to push you to go in a direction which obviously wasn't the truth according to you? I think they obviously assumed that, like so many victims of domestic abuse, that it must have been a repeat incident after many that hadn't been reported or notified of. And I understand that. I understand that when someone does come forward as a victim of abuse, it is important to let them know that you understand it may have happened before and you're on their side. But repeating it constantly and then refusing to take a different answer is another question it's too much mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. is too much there was a very early sense of frustration of we will believe you we will believe you but you're not believing me um, mm -hmm. and i assume i can only assume that their intentions were good mm -hmm. but it really didn't help okay and, and obviously when, when the attack happened mm -hmm. i mean you were okay to call the police? I mean, was, yeah. was he still there but while you were calling the police? I mean, what, what happened? I mean, um, how, I suppose, was it uh, blows to your head or somewhere else? Yep, so there were, uh, I think, three or four, they reckon. I mean, I wasn't counting. Uh, blows to the side of my head. Um, how I managed to get up, hold a conversation and function as normal is anyone's guess. I obviously mm -hmm. have a hard head. Um, I needed a few lots of stitches, but nothing... There was no major physical damage. I'm very, very lucky. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he just got up and started getting ready for the day as if everything was normal with a very, very glazed look. It was very much like he wasn't actually there. Um, yeah, I spoke to... I, <laughs> I phoned an ambulance for him. Wow. It didn't occur to me at all that I would need it because I was up and talking and I felt okay. But the man I had lived with for 12 years, been married to for 10, um, 
So even though was he didn't fight, you're, still, okay. you're still worried about him and you know, your immediate concern wasn't the uh, attack on you, it was for him, wow, okay. okay. Of course, because this is not a man who's ever been remotely aggressive. I'm the one who's fiery. Um, mm. You know, we've never really argued. Very gentle, very calm, very loving. Um, so of course, the concern for him was huge as to what had happened and how do I get him help? Because he obviously needed it. Mm -hmm. um, it never occurred to me that the police would turn up as well. Wow. Hadn't crossed my mind at all. So that was a shock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, mm -hmm. um, obviously the effects then, you, you know, you, you say you, you lost your job, you lost your family. Yeah. What, what happened there? You know, why did, did that happen basically? So one of the things I still have difficulty with is I, being a childminder, registered to work from home, Ofsted, who of course, regulate childminders in the UK, decided that I would not be allowed to continue working because there had been violence in the home. Right. I did question this extensively because the violent person, the cause of the violence was no longer going to be in the home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it took me nearly two years of fighting constantly for them to agree to reinstate my registration. Uh, and by that point, it was too late. I, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. It was too much. Mm -hmm. um, but for, you know, a year and a half, two years, there were, they would come out, they would re-inspect, they would say it would be fine, and then send me a letter saying, actually, because there's violence in the home, we can't do it. And then it would just rinse and repeat again and again and again. Extremely frustrating. Um, and I still, to this day, I'm not really convinced that's the right way to go. I understand that point initially, if there is violence in a home and you're looking after young children, you can't allow that. But at the same time, to ban me from being able to work for however long is ridiculous. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't sit well. Yeah, of course not. I mean, um, yeah, so, I mean, as comfortable as you are sharing, what was the state of your mind in terms of mindset and self-esteem? You know, how low did it dip? What were some of the thoughts going through your mind? Uh, and, and how did you cope? Well, wow, that's interesting. I am um, the first thought was that this man who is gentle and kind and loving and an excellent father and husband is very ill. Mm -hmm. And I needed to make sure that he was okay as much as possible given the circumstances. So for nine months or so until the until the whole thing came to court and sentencing was decided, um I focused really on him and the children, making sure that I did everything I could. Uh, I didn't know at the time the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, are supposed to be impartial. It definitely wasn't the impression I got. Um, I had no one and nothing and no information. I didn't know where the hearings were. I had to find out from reading it in the local newspaper because the police wouldn't tell me anything in an attempt to protect me in some odd way, but it meant that I was very much left out in the dark and had difficulty. So for a number of months, I dedicated my time to doing anything I could, including visiting him a few times a week, taking the children to visit when he was uh, awaiting uh, sentencing and so on. Um, yeah, that whole period of time is a little bit blurry now, but I had a focus, I had something to focus on looking at how the court system worked, looking at sentencing guidelines, making sure everyone we had ever met or worked with wrote letters in with kind of, I suppose, a character testimony, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Everything I could to make sure that he would be as okay as possible. And the result is he was sentenced to six years, three of which were served, and that was in a therapeutic prison. And that to me, it was the best possible outcome. I couldn't ask for anything better than that mm -hmm. because there's no point locking someone up for extensive periods of time with no rehabilitation and then expecting them to be able to function when they come back out however many years later. I feel really strongly about that. Um, so yeah, after that, my world fell apart a bit. I didn't have that focus anymore. 
Uh, my children were having difficulty coping, as was I. Uh, I had what I imagine was a mini breakdown. Mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. seeing really odd things that weren't there. So there were cartoon fish swimming oh. on the street when I would cross it. Um, books on the shelves would kind of move side to side and dance around on their own. And I realized at that point that I needed to do something. Okay, so, so this wasn't immediately after? This was kind this of... This was like... about close to a year later. Okay, so because of the immediate aftermath, you were more focused on, on him and your children. Absolutely, you yes. Kind of, you know, that was basically your coping me mechanism. You didn't yes, really absolutely. at yeah. all. And then once yeah. that went, it's kind of like, well, now that's gone, there's nothing there. And then yes. the pressure of it all got to you. Absolutely. And you started yeah. having these hallucinations and things. Okay, so mm. when you were having these hallucinations you know were you like logically aware that you, you, you've had a traumatic experience and then the things that you're seeing now are not really reality they're just an effect or were you just so confused by it all that you didn't know what was going on i was very aware that it wasn't real that i it didn't stop me being able to see these fish swimming in midair as i walked down the street but i also knew logically that this wasn't right and it wasn't real and my concern at that point was what if it gets worse and then i don't know the difference Mm -hmm. I am all my children have left at that point. I can't really afford to go completely crazy and not function. Mm -hmm. So I went to see my GP um, who diagnosed me with PTSD, um, which is not surprising, I suppose, uh, but informed me they couldn't offer counseling. All they had was uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy classes as a group. And none of them were particularly suited for me. Um, he sent me to three. I seem to remember one was on assertiveness training, which I have no difficulty with. The other one was dealing with suicidal tendencies, which I wasn't at all. And there was mm -hmm. one other I can't remember now, but they really weren't appropriate for me at all. And I knew that I needed some kind of counseling or therapy. So I found a local counselor. She is to this day probably the best thing I have ever done she is absolutely amazing. And uh, she was able to give me quite a heftily discounted price considering I had no income or way of doing anything. And um, I saw her for what I thought would be six sessions and turned out to be about 18 months. Wow, okay. Yeah. And, and, and what were the kind of things that she, she did to help you? I mean, what, what was it that, well, what did do the trick in, in helping you get, get through this period and stop the hallucinations? She helped me to think of myself. Um, and I think a lot of women particularly tend to do this. We are taught from an early age to look after and to care for others. And I certainly have been doing that all my life through no one's particular fault, but it happens. And I think with being a childminder and a wife and a mother, I completely lost a sense of self in there. And mm. the first thing I had to do was find who I was and what I wanted. And so we worked through things, going back to childhood as these things often do, and it made a huge difference. And therapy is not easy for anyone who's had it before. It is incredibly difficult because you take a selection of memories or items or things that you know to be true and you change the perspective and suddenly everything you know is now completely different. And that can blow your mind quite a lot. So it was, it was a really difficult time and there were days, possibly even weeks, where I would just lie in bed or on the sofa and I couldn't get up. Um, mm -hmm. I realised my poor children now, I, I was there in person but not in spirit really for quite a while. Um, but that is how you get through things, you have to take out all the difficulties in order to sort them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what we did. Yeah, yeah. And so that period when, when you when you you're going through the silence and, and, and the bed. Mm -hmm. I think in, in your article, it said that you were actually communicating with your children by writing things down. Yeah. So, so that was only for a few days. Okay. I mean, so now we're looking at three years later right. when he was due to come out on probation. And it never occurred to me it would be an issue, but suddenly I was getting phone call after phone call after phone call after phone call seemingly out of the blue, asking me all the questions all over again. Um, they wanted to know, was I aware that there was a really high risk of murder-suicide? And they rattle it off like we're talking about the weather. Um, I, I think people forget how much it hits the person on the other end of the phone having to hear that. 
Um, was I aware that I was at risk of arson? Was I aware that I needed alarms on my windows and doors? Was I aware that I could change my name and move? And it was just overwhelming mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. have all this. And um, at the time, I was in a fairly young relationship, which really buckled under the pressure. So I was dealing with all these questions and children's services wanting to do a full investigation again. again. Wow. Um, second time. Yeah. Uh, and the loss of a relationship. And it just became too much. And as you can tell, I can talk. But at that time... I, I imagine it visually as if you have a huge crowd of people trying to get out of a small doorway and everybody gets stuck and nobody can get out. And it felt like the words were that. There was so much in there that I couldn't get it out. It was just stuck. And so for about three to five days, not too long, um, I told the kids I had lost my voice, which I suppose I had. And I just, I couldn't, it just couldn't come out. I don't know how else to put that. I've never experienced anything like that before or since. Mm -hmm. And it was, and, it was very difficult. Okay. And, and in terms of, you know, were you judging yourself in your own mind? Were, were you attaching labels to yourself? Was, was there any, uh, you know, crit thoughts that were bringing you down further? I mean, what was going on in your mind about yourself? I think the difficulty I was having is that everything they were telling me about the risk was not what my gut feeling and intuition were telling me. Um, and I very much run on intuition a lot. I have found it to almost 100% of the time be correct when I listen to it. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, I'm being told that there's high risk and we should think of moving and all the security measures being put in place and putting alarms on windows and doors, which I never remember to turn off before opening them. Um, all this drama. And yet there's a man who is still gentle and kind, who wanted to be hanged for what he's done. Um, and I just... It didn't, it didn't match up. It was like my brain was kind of split in two at that point. Of course, wanting to protect myself and my children from any potential harm, but also knowing that none of this was right and it wasn't the right way to go. And I think it was just confusion more than anything. And self-doubt, am I doing the right thing? Should I have moved? Should we be doing something different? Should I be more careful and not let them walk down the street? All these questions, but... I mean, as it turns out now, it's, it's okay. But the confusion, I think, was incredibly difficult to handle, combined with the loss of a relationship, um, which is hard enough at the best of times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And children's services, again, being involved, okay. which they have to do to make sure yeah. the kids are safe, given mm -hmm. the circumstances. I understand that I have no problem with them. They have been fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it is incredibly intrusive at a time that's already difficult. Right. And, 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 you know, obviously when, when the trial was going through, there was a retiring counsel um, and he's had a 30 year career. Mm. And he said to you, this is the most unusual case he has ever come across. Now, obviously there's yes. a lot of domestic violence and attempted murder. So what made this one so unusual for him with all his experience? I think what made it so unusual is that we have a clear cut case of a planned attempted murder here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And yet, the victim wanted to do anything to help the perpetrator to be able to function and deal with what he'd done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the perpetrator wanted to be put away for life or to be hanged right. because of the nature of what he'd done. And it was all a bit back to front, I suppose, yeah, compared yeah. to what it might usually be. And the fact that there had never been a history of any form of aggression, violence or otherwise at mm -hmm. all. Um, I think just made it so unusual. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and then um, you talk about the, the defense counsel. I mean, you were sitting in court or, or you were sat somewhere and you got all of these emotions and feelings. And, and then he did something which uplifted you. So first tell us, what did he do and, and why did it have such a profound impact on you? It was probably at my lowest point. I don't remember if it was before or after the actual sentencing, but it was around that time. I do remember it was my son's birthday, the one day I had asked them not to um, have a hearing. 
didn't quite work out that way. Um, I was all over the place. It's an incredibly emotional time. I don't know what's going to happen. And I sat down after the hearing outside the court. It's a court I now know quite well because I've been there a few times volunteering. Um, and this man came up to me with the wig and gown, like you see in the movies. And he just stopped and took off his wig and said, how are you? And that was it. Mm -hmm. It was a real question, not a throwaway while he was looking at his watch or something else to do. And that, I don't know why that small act of humanity at a point when I was at my very lowest and I couldn't figure out how on earth to go forward with my life at all made such a big difference because someone actually took the time to come and ask how I was. It's such a simple thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when someone is really in the depths of despair, it can, it can literally be life-changing. Mm -hmm. And it was. And I'm now very lucky that I actually know him in a completely different capacity. He's now a youth worker at my church. Um, and yes, I, it makes me realize that the smallest things can make such a huge difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that so was it. Do you think that, so in speaking to you now, and obviously what, what your therapist says, so you've spent most of your life looking out for others, doing things for others, and, and, and pretty much not thinking about yourself. Do you think the impact was because for the first time somebody's asking you about you and it wasn't about anybody else, it was simply about you. Do you think that's why it had such a profound impact on you? I don't know if it was so much that someone else was asking about me or because I took the time to actually think, how am I? Mm -hmm. I think he caused me to think of myself in all the craziness that was happening. Yeah. To just take that moment to stop. Yeah. And that was amazing. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like there were no other people. I'm very lucky. I had some incredible friends mm -hmm. who would visit me, you know, on a weekly basis. Friends who came with me to court who were there through the whole thing. They have been amazing and I will never be able to thank them enough for everything they've done. Um, including... Uh, quite a long time later, the police returned to me in a large black sack. All the items they'd taken from the home. Right. In there was the handle of a hammer. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if it was the one. The moment I realized what I was looking at, I closed it and asked a friend to come and just dispose of the whole bag. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter what else was in there. We'd done without it for years. I, I, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't deal with that. So I have had amazing friends. But I think with the council asking me how I was, it just made me stop and think, how am I? How am I really? How do I want to be? And something there made a difference. And that day, I remember walking home to make, you know, my, to get my son's birthday evening going. And there was a rainbow above the street, all the way across from one side to the other. And I remember just thinking, if there are signs, I'll take that as one. Yeah. So it was the combination of the two that I suppose made me think about being able to to keep going mm -hmm. yeah and well tell us you know how has your life changed i mean you, uh, from a professional and business point of view now mm -hmm. so you've lost your job your you, your marriage is broken down um yeah. what what did you do and, and and where are you now so i think one of the best things about all this is i used to be, I hate saying this, I'm quite ashamed of it, but um, I was very judgmental before this. People who were divorced, you know, couldn't keep their marriage going. Single parents, same thing. People on benefits, you know, scrounging off the state. All the, all the usual kind of right-wing rhetoric. I was one of those. Mm -hmm. And then of course I became every one of those things I hated literally overnight. And I think that was a really good kick up the backside to make me stop and think about what I knew, what I thought I knew, and what I want to learn in life. Mm -hmm. I think that was the beginning of being able to open my mind up a bit to other possibilities, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had done my early years foundation degree, so two years of a, 
a, a full degree in, in early years, so for childminding. And I had also taught and helped to teach childminding to new people coming in. So I was becoming more familiar with education. I myself had dropped out at 15, so mm-hmm. I'd never been to university before, never done anything like this. And I really enjoyed it. And one of the modules we learned was um, law. And it was at the time the Equality Act came in. And I remember reading the entire thing from cover to cover and just loving the experience of doing that. Realizing I'm a complete nerd and actually I do have a real interest in this. And so, of course, with everything happening, I had to take a few years out to focus on myself, my children and so on. But the idea never really went away. So I started a law degree at the Open University. Absolutely hated it because distance learning and working from home doesn't work well for me. The irony being that we're now in COVID, so I'm going to have to do that anyway. So I started again at university from scratch Mm -hmm. and I'm with Brighton and I am about to start my third year of my law degree. And I have a good idea ahead of what I want to do and how I want to get there. I'm also aware the success rate is incredibly low for what I want to do. So there are backup options aplenty as well. Um, What I do know is that I love learning. I love doing things and pushing forward and questioning boundaries. And I will continue to do that in whatever capacity I can. Okay. I also... Go on. Oh, what, what is that? You know, you, you've got the plan and, and you know what you want to do, but the success rate is also awesome. what, what <laughs> Give me is... all my secrets. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to. So I did a, I don't know if I should admit this publicly, I did a mini, I was invited, I was very lucky. I was invited to do a mini pupilage about a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very lucky that I was invited because I didn't know what one was. I didn't know the difference between a solicitor and a barrister. I thought a lawyer was a lawyer. Um, no idea about any of this. So I'm very, very grateful that I was invited to do this. I went on it. I absolutely hated it. I cried on the second day. Um, It's not something I've admitted before, so this will be interesting. (laughs) I really didn't want to go in, and I'm generally not a crier, and I'm quite stubborn. I did complete it, however, and then realized that I needed to double check how I felt about it. So I did another one, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Okay. okay so what, what's Absolutely the, what, what, what made you cry the first time and, and make you love it the second? I mean, what was it the first time? And then what changed the second? I time? think it was just the unknown. I had no idea there was so much waiting around in court for something to happen. And then suddenly everything goes at full pelt. I think they refer to it as rush to slow. Um, but I, I just I had no idea what was going on. And the formality of the environment, I'd been working with children and raising children my whole adult life. Um, Having to wear a suit was hard enough. It was like wearing alien skin. Um, And it was just so unknown and so bizarre. And I didn't understand most of the words that were being used because it's all, even with the best of intentions, completely legalese. Um, uh, My name was Mini Pupil for three days which, you know, now I accept is just part of the package. But I think because I didn't know what a mini pupillage was, it was a shock. Mm -hmm. It was a shock and it was unknown. And what I try and do is if I absolutely hate something, I make sure I do it again. Right. Then I stick to this point because most people would quit after that experience. I know. Forget about it. I hate it. I've cried it. I've tried it. I've cried. I don't want to do it. So what is it? in your own you know, mind, what, what, what's the driving force to, to go at something again, despite hating it so much? I was discussing this actually, I did a Facebook live video this morning and I was talking about what I refer to as my year of yes. At some point, probably after all the counseling, I decided that for one year or so, whenever something new came my way that looked mildly scary, difficult or unknown, I would say yes jump first and then figure out where I'm going to land. And I did. And doing the mini pupillage was part of that. And then I thought, well, maybe the reason I didn't like it is just because I had no idea what I was going into. I didn't prepare myself. I didn't look it up. I had no idea what I was turning up for. Um, So I thought maybe I just need to make sure 
I think it's a process of elimination thing. That's kind of how I work. So, um, so when you were doing making that decision then, was it simply because of the challenge that you wanted to do something or did you still have like a goal that yes, you want to be a lawyer or a barrister that was driving you forward? I didn't have that goal at all at that point. I just enjoyed okay. studying. That's all. I wanted to do the degree because I wanted to study and because I'd never been to university. That yeah. was it. No, okay. didn't want to be a lawyer, didn't want to do any of this stuff, absolutely not. And one mini pupillage and I thought, I hate every minute of this, I'm never doing it. Let's do it one more time just to make sure. And then going into it with my eyes open a bit more, understanding what it was, what the purpose of being a barrister was, how it worked, um, and really observing and listening the second time. I realized that actually I really like this environment. I like being in court. Um, I really enjoy it. And very shortly after I had the option to volunteer for the clock legal companion scheme in family court. And I think that really cemented my love of doing this, of being able to be in that environment, getting to know the security guards, the ushers, uh, getting to spend time with judges. I did some marshalling. Um, going in with different chambers and having different experiences, meeting clients and litigants, it's just fantastic. And the more I do it, the more I want to be able to be part of it. Okay, so, so what is your that. plan now? What is your plan and what is that goal? So we never actually answered that question. So I think I'm looking along the lines of family barrister, certainly okay. barrister. I did do a couple of vacation schemes absolutely detested the first one. I actually fell asleep at one point. Um, and so I did it again in my usual method and it confirmed that I definitely didn't want to go down that route. Um, I love what barristers do. As far as I can see from the first day I went into court and saw them, they are translators. You translate, you take things from basic English and transfer it to legalese and then translate it back again for your client. And I love the idea of being able to be part of that. So family barrister is definitely the aim. If not, however, volunteering, working or anyhow within a court environment is fine. However that happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And You've got a business going on as well, so obviously you're an entrepreneur. Tell us a little bit about that. I run my own home-based beauty business. Um, yes, I've been doing it nearly four years now. I absolutely love everything about it. It's with a multi-level marketing company, which is kind of like a franchise from home without the overheads, which definitely helps. Um, I sell makeup and beauty products, and I also enable other women to be able to work this business, for, it's, it's set up for people who cannot work in traditional environments, for mm. either parents of young children, carers, people who are gravely ill and in hospital for long terms, undergoing treatment. This really is for people who need that extra something. And it provided me with an absolute lifeline, uh, not necessarily just financially, but in meeting the people I've met, in going to conventions and learning more about self-development and self-improvement, um, teaching me how to use social media, which of course is how I met you. Um, it has been absolutely amazing. I love every second of it. And the company I work with was set up to fund a charity that supports survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Oh. Um, and I have been able to send people I know on the Haven retreat, which helps to support and guide them forward in life and it's just it works well for me yeah okay I absolutely so, love it brilliant and so how, how are you managing splitting the time between the two then you know, obviously the, the the legal career and the the studying and then the business how and obviously the, the family life as well with, with the parenting children. volunteering yeah. yeah so how how are you finding that and how are you managing and, and what impact is it having on your own mindset uh, I mean, do you still have moments of low self-esteem and, and, and drain or are you pretty much at it all day, every day? You know, explain, explain a little I bit. I do have PTSD and part of that is depression. Now it comes and goes, mostly not around, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but one of the things I have really learned over the last few years, both with therapy and with self-improvements, um, 
is that it's important to make room for the difficult times. So if I can feel a bout of depression coming on, and depression doesn't mean feeling down in the dumps. Uh, for me, it's very physical. I wake up and suddenly it's like everything is two shades of gray darker than it was before. Everything feels very heavy. Lifting up my head feels almost like when you come out of surgery and you're a bit sluggish. Everything is slow. Everything is heavy. My thoughts are slow and foggy. And I know at that point it may vanish in a day or two, or I may need to clear some room in my diary to allow for it. Mm -hmm. So what I've learned to do if I do feel that coming is to wipe everything from my calendar that's not essential and spend some time just being. It sounds very hippie-ish. It took me a while to get my head around it. Mm -hmm. I think of it visually. I am a tea drinker. I drink tea intravenously. So I think of depression as someone who's constantly knocking at the door. And when I invite it in and we have a cup of tea together and I can acknowledge it, it can go on its way when it's ready. Whereas when you ignore it, the constant tapping or knocking. So, so you're not fighting away, you're not trying to crazy. block it away all the time. You're no, saying, absolutely. okay, you want to come in, come in, let's deal with it. And then yep. it goes away in its own time. Wow, okay. Absolutely. I think it's important to acknowledge that it's all part of who I am. Um, and fighting myself is not really something I want to spend energy on. So if that's part of who I am at that time, it's there for a reason. It needs to be heard. So I'm going to sit with it and hear it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Yeah. It a lot of As sense. for everything else, um, I work really well in chaos and last minute deadline. I'm one of those. And I have learned that when I do things beautifully to a timetable and organize my time, I really don't do as well. So okay. I'm always running around like a headless chicken. I am the problem solver that people come to for things. I will get it done. And the busier I am, the more I seem to be able to do. So they say, if you want something done, ask a busy person. I'm absolutely that. Uh, so I do my uni work as and when I can. I tend to work well late at night. So when the kids are in bed. Mm -hmm. um, I do my beauty business, uh, Beauty with Tanya. I do that around whatever else is going on. So pockets of time here and there, it's social media based, 15 minutes between classes, when I'm sitting down in the morning or half awake, I communicate with my team on Facebook and Messenger. So it, it can be done in little pockets of time whenever I have that handy. And it works so well for me. Okay, yeah. and obviously with the entrepreneurship and the business, how, how do you think you're going to handle them working for somebody else and being in a, a traditional job? Oh, sorry, just a moment. All right, I'm back. Sorry, yeah. a phone call just came through there. <laughs> um, well, with being a barrister, from what I understand, most of it is self-employed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, which I have been for 14 odd years now with childminding anyway. Um, so that doesn't bother me enormously. I know that's a huge fear for a lot of people and really it's not scary. Go for it. Do it. Um, I don't know. Uh, things will adjust how they will. I think it's important to have a plan, but make sure that plan has elastic contingency built in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, very rarely does everything go exactly to plan. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite happy to take a different pathway around. The way I'm going with my beauty business is I don't have to have a huge involvement in it personally so much because I now run a team of people mm -hmm. who do it. Um, and I am, I am a people person. So that works really well for me. One of the concerns I have is being recognized. I do a lot of my business on social media live and I have, I was sitting with, um, Kafkas, do you know Kafkas? The children, mm -hmm. family, yeah, they're going to yeah, yeah. question on this now. Um, and uh, someone came in and she said, oh, you're that, you're that woman who does makeup. And I remember thinking at that point, that could be an issue in future. Why do you I'm think that is? Why? Well, I'm Why? not entirely sure on professional boundaries and ethics of being recognized from a Facebook live video, which I talk very much like this, very candidly and openly, openly almost like a diary, I suppose, um, in a professional environment. I'm not entirely sure how that would work, but I will cross that boundary when I come to it. 
as far as I'm concerned, I really want to go down the barrister route and I love my business and I don't plan on giving it up. So I will find a way somehow. Excellent. And, um, you know, we'll be wrapping up soon, but what then is, what would you say is your biggest takeaway from the experience that you've had, which you'd like to share with other people? I think hindsight is wonderful. I think hindsight is wonderful. Um, I was certainly not unhappy in my marriage or my life at the time, but hindsight tells me I was sleepwalking through quite a lot of it. I think the good thing about having this kind of experience is it really wakes you up and makes you appreciate life in a way that perhaps you weren't able to before. Um, my takeaway from this is that everyone has their own story. It's important to look behind the obvious headlines. Um, and for me, life is amazing. Every bit of it, the good and the bad and the ugly. It's all part and parcel of making the person that you are. You cannot have one without the other. Um, so it's important to sit with it, to drink tea with it, to experience whatever comes your way in life and accept it as part of the overall picture. I'm very much a bigger picture person, if that makes sense. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to see that when things are difficult. And going forward, I don't know what the future holds. I hope that I've been an example to the children that even if you don't do something at the correct time and you start university when you're 40, um, that that's still okay. And that you can do anything you want to. It's really important to me for people to know, and I wish I understood this earlier, that it really isn't what happens to you that makes a difference. It's what you do with it. And I made a conscious choice not to bury myself alive, mm -hmm. but to get up and live. And I think that's, that's it. That's why I'm here doing what I'm doing. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's been a phenomenal interview. Like the time has just flown by. Um, Thank you. you know, do you have any final thoughts, any final words or final pieces of advice or encouragement before we uh, finish up? Yeah. For people who aren't sure whether to do something or not, do it. Just do it. Jump with both feet, head first, and figure it out on the way. Because otherwise, there are things you'll never go for. How will you know? If I hadn't done that second mini pupillage, despite having literally cried about it, and as I say, I'm really not that person, um, I would never have all these plans going forward now. Mm -hmm. And I have never been so happy or so motivated. Brilliant to get up and live every day. So just do it. Excellent. Excellent. And, and how can people connect with you? Where can they find you if they want to connect? Um, I am on LinkedIn. I'm trying to find what my, I think it's linkedin.com and then Tanya Beck. Yeah, we'll, we'll drop the uh, link in, in, in the comments. That would be great. Thank <laughs> you. I'm also on Facebook, but a very different profile and, and area there. Um, beauty business is beautywithtanya.com but I'm very much all over social media. So find me through that. And I'm always happy to connect with people. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, again, that was inspiring and it was wonderful. Um, so once again, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm thank sure you. you're going to inspire, you already have inspired a lot of people and you will inspire a lot more people as well. Not just overcoming the adversity, but starting a degree late and, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and trying something even though you didn't like it the first time and, and, and yeah. going for it. So um, thank you. And I, I wish you the best of luck in, in your future endeavors. Um, thank you. And everybody else, hope you enjoyed the episode and we will see you next time. Take care. Thank now. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.